told me that my rational fear and indignation is a cliché. A rose by any other name would make buying flowers to put on the graves of our loved ones even more confusing than it already is. I am sorry. I know this is a bad poem. Let's go write some more. Thank you. Uh, he's great. Okay, next is Mike. Followed by Becca. I'm going to just say you go right after him. That's what I'm going to say. All right, this is called East of Center. The desert climbs east into the watermelon mountains, offering its cactus flowers to boulders that crumble like croutons into the mouth of the old canyon. The foothills are dirty plates scrubbed by night winds to be reused day after day. Below is a city that drinks from the water table, that invisible wet tongue that sucks seeds and pushes juniper, bear grass, and Apache plume through its teeth and into the brown world. In Albuquerque, the desert's dry lips are sealed with concrete, Costco's, and buses that run on time. The sun has cracked the sidewalks of East Central Avenue, and the people are split wide open. They stand in parking lots, refusing to blink. Shade is a blind spot. The thing to do is shout into every car that passes with an open window. Shout as loud as you can. Stand in the sun long enough, and you can enter any world you want. All right, I got one more. This is called Minor Holidays. I'm like reading through the mic and somehow like, I'm going cross-eyed here. All right, let me move this to the side. Minor Holidays. St. Valentine. We use the rusty Chinese cleaver to cut a frozen pizza on his own failed cardboard. Today the ants take the crumbs and I know she hides the bleeding at our third interview this week. St. Patrick. We argue why the corned beef boils and the cabbage, the weight of a child's head, rolls off the cutting board. I mentioned that cabbage is 49 cents per pound and how expensive it would be for us to raise a child. Super Bowl Sunday. I sit in a recliner and, and reach backwards to feel the muscles push my shoulders to my ears. I build temples to the fresh cut grass and breathe in the ghosts of old wind sprints. She watches Beyonce's leg run from rib to ankle. Thanksgiving, we have no family, living on an island of our own making. We have pots and pans, a little furniture, and a dog who claims us as her pack. We run with her, sniffing the moments and howling at the years. Black Friday, we wake up early and haul two old bikes up a muddy trail. The highway hushes behind us and the light flirts through the trees. We are eight years old again, each other's first crush and last love, the way it should and can never be. Thanks. I didn't print my poem out, so I'm reading from my phone, and I used to yell at people who did this. <laughs> Makes me look younger. All right. Talk amongst yourselves. Oh, yeah, I see what you mean. It's like, I can't. Okay, got it. So um, this poem, oh, I have a new book out. You guys should buy it. <laughs> um, thanks. It's on Dancing Girl Press. Um, online seven dollars and um yeah so this is from this is from that book and we're still in albuquerque so how to forgive in the desert first attach yourself to the sky go to the furthest edge of city violet starstruck closer to god not everyone has the heart for it some hearts are less red find yourself a cloud kingdom don't come down easily. Stay up in that thin air. Don't think about how you can't breathe. People have not breathed here for 11,000 years. Second, try to remember why you're here. Slick rock playground. These are hippos on their sides. No water. Arroyo. Say arroyo over and over until your throat is a canyon. Third, pray to the creatures especially the whiptail lizards whose backs are lined like cucumbers. Birds will come and go. Fine dusted worries will land on your toes. 
coarser planets in your hair. Running will result in headache. Please do not run. Remember, you will never be able to see the plateau and the canyon at the same time. When you're walking one way, you will only remember what is behind you. When you look behind you, you will only guess what's ahead. What rock will arise? What might, what might snake in front of you? What bright vested jogger will arrive in your conscience suddenly with tangibility? You do not know who you are anymore. Now drive home, shudder in the kitchen, watch him eat cold cereal as you try to explain your tiny heart, the handfuls of stones in your pockets. Thanks. Okay, so the next two readers will be Shannon and then Caroline. I have two. We'll see over their own time. So the first one's an old workshop goodie called That Time of Year. The Christmas after his wife left him, my father-in-law says into a punched glass that he feels like an outsider at her family's holiday party. My husband and I say nothing. I slide on new bracelets and thumb through pristine books, ooing and eyeing over the cousin's family photos in a homemade calendar somehow considered to be a gift that someone else would actually want like the chocolate-covered cherries my grandmother-in-law gives each year to the kids who robotically thank her and then slide each ball oozing rose-colored viscous into a trash can. The aunt-in-law with too much teeth clucks over the babies and asks when we are going to start building a family. We eat too much food and sing too many carols, and I'm asked to play someone's untuned violin. A year ago, my mother-in-law had squeezed into a slim-fitted plaid skirt eaten two bites of someone's wilted taco salad, and then crept to the empty patio to call a friend from her high school days about holiday travels. Had I not been busy following a toddler with a toy gun and a Napoleon complex, I would have seen in her that same instinct to get through these family functions if we could designate the one person to talk to, even if it's a curly-haired kid or an online phantom resurrecting the past with texts about meeting up at the day's end after things quiet down. She left for good while her boys slept, taking nothing but a suitcase of clothes. Now her ex-husband sits in a circle of in-laws, which is another way of saying almost relatives, the almost grandmother and almost cousins and almost presents that are more for you and your spouse, who, by the way, is the one thing there that's actually yours. So I get it, I want to say to him, with something akin to practice calm and hushed desperation. Okay, and then this one is called Where You Were Carried. Today, let's transpose the music. It's easy. You must change how you look at things, but the rules remain the same. Follow the trajectory of notes, plant your fingers carefully, and hoist yourself up or down. Do it long enough, and this new way of playing will come naturally. Breathing in time, the sing-song rhythm of crying. Playing vibrato, the same bones and muscles you use to wave at old friends bringing flower wreaths, cards, and bags of food to your porch, or to wave at babies and shopping carts. Hold this position a long time without breaking, the wrists twisted, shoulder rigid, fingers clamped on strings. Your hands just know where to go, without frets, requiring total trust. You can pull it off for hours, bent in the most absurd and inhuman conditions, and I promise you will find that you even enjoy it. I used to practice on pencils right before my lessons, for which I always felt unprepared. Once, my teacher said I gave her chills, that I did more than just play notes. I understood them. No matter how often I looked at the wooden body nested in my arms, I couldn't figure how to replicate that kind of understanding. This morning, I reached. When I was done reaching for reasons like love or work or God to rest myself out of bed, instead for my violin. The weight is heavy, but it's actually the violin that carries you. Play for an hour without thinking about the hour, and you'll see what I mean. The violin sings, too, even when it's not playing. Did you know this? Open the case, and you'll hear its faint whisper. The air will rattle the strings. You will pull its body from its velvet bed, place the bow on the ark, watch hands no longer yours move, and breathe a rhythm foreign to you. You'll go miles from where you started to a place where you were carried, 
and the only thing you will bring with you is the familiar warmth of wood and fiber in your palms. Thank you. I have two poems, whoops, uh, the first of which is called Solace. I have held on to this openness, like a gap between your white fingers, stretching and closing. You are a spider and you keep me warm. You are a spider and you keep me steady. The air hangs heavy, fragrant, and I have held on to this openness, openness, how the lilac looks in April, in May, how you have beheld my air, standing by the cemetery trees, hands wet with dim light. The openness of these perfect human teeth, your neck strains and catches shadows in the evening. In the evening, all I wanted to be was a thing, without a time, without a space, the whole of the world, gone to the dark. I wanted to be a thing with nowhere but your room, no light but your candle, to lean into the void and know those hands would hold me, those gaps fill. You are a spider, but you keep me warm. Wow, I guess this is sort of a creepy, crawly-themed poetry reading because this one is also, uh, also creepy crawly related. Uh, it's called uh, Cicadas Sing Their Own Funeral Song. I think about you like summer, immortalized in certain red crevices of my heart, like fireflies in damp air, right after the sun sets, like cicadas wriggling out of their carapaces, red eyes emerging. I think of that smell, mosquito repellent and iron, the inside of your cheek bitten to rawness. That summer, too, had a rawness to it, like a cat stretched out on the hot road, fresh, bloody, full of promise. Okay, we've got an addition to the list, which is very exciting. Um, so Zach will go next, followed by Mariah. That's me. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Zach. I'm just a student here, undergrad. Do not have the skill or confidence of any of these other people, but I can try. Um, this one is called Abstract Cocking. Golden vultures eat decayed apples, something most don't gawk at. I do. Revel in the revelations. That's what the roots of, wed wed of redwoods whisper. Mole and mysteries, that's, the what, that's what the peak of mountains utter. I do both while gawking. I've always admired the vultures, considered myself the purest one. But it's baffling. Why do they feast on rotten fruit? Why do I? Mole and revel, not every corrupt consumer does this. I'm not golden, keep that. I'm ethereal, earthly, a sliver of pure abstraction. <clears throat> and then um, I'm going to do one called Winter, oh, if that's cool. <laughs> Rosalia, nos quedamos solitos. I just wanted to tell you, it's true, but not. Paradoxes are where you'll live, love. The winter was cruel and meek. The scythe caressed my being, coldness, birth, numbness. Nos quedamos solitos. Yet here I be, being alive and well enough. That's good enough. Gods of spring, I thank you. Life, I thank you. Nos quedamos solitos. And that's it. Kansas. Um, I only write poems about Kansas. 
You're beautiful, reads the bridge over the highway towards the Kansas City International Airport. I notice how Word wants to autocorrect it to beautiful, but spray paint and cement aren't a forgiving canvas. I imagine the message is also saying goodbye, knowingly nodding to the